Hello everyone and welcome to today's Geobytes presentation on warming world melting ice. My name is Mags Abbott and I am one of the schools and colleges liaison assistants at the university and today I'm joined by Dr Amanda Williams who will be running today's Geobytes presentation. Say hello Amanda. Hello. You'll see her shortly and Zoe my colleague who will be moderating any questions as they come in. Say hello Zoe. Hi everyone. I will shortly be handing over to Amanda for the presentation and during the presentation you will be given the opportunity to ask questions and get involved in activities via the chat function on the right hand side of the screen. Your audio and video won't be shared but any questions answers you do post can be done so anonymously if you wish. You just have to click that you wish to be anonymous. You can like other questions that people may have asked to indicate you're interested also. Zoe will collect any questions and ask Amanda these at the end of the session. OK, I think we're ready to start, so it's over to you, Amanda. Hello and um, welcome to today's session. Um, my name is Dr Amanda Williams. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Chester in the Department of Geography and International Development. What that means is I actually um, teach um, a wide range of physical geography topics um, across all three levels. Um, and I also do research um, into glaciology, hence this talk, um, but also look at climate and environmental change. Um, over the, the last um, few thousand years, over the last ice age and since, and also looking at contemporary climate change and some of the kind of future climate change issues. So this talk today is really wrapping those two interests together. It is taking my, my interest in glaciers and then also thinking about climate change and especially kind of um, reflecting on, on the recent um, climate conference and thinking about um, some of the impacts of climate change on glaciers and um, what the impacts are and what can we do about it. So in this talk, I'm going to split it into two parts. First of all, I'm going to talk about the current status of the world's glaciers um, and then just have a think about how they are reacting to climate change. And in the second half of the talk, I'm going to talk about some of the impacts of melting glaciers on the people and planet. So as we've already said, I encourage you, please do put some questions in the chat. Um, I'll get to them later on. And certainly if you've got any other general physical geography questions, I'll do my best to try and answer those at the end as well. So if you've got something you're covering elsewhere at the moment, I'll do my best to try and give a, a little bit of feedback on that too. So move on to the first slide. Um, if we actually look at how much of the Earth is covered by glaciers, that's probably about 10% of the land area. And notice I said land area there because obviously a lot of the Earth's surface is covered by ocean. This particular map shows you all of the glaciers on land. It excludes obviously Greenland and Iceland because otherwise you just get a mass of pink. Um, but you can see we've got a large range of glaciers, particularly in um, high altitude mountainous areas but also at high latitude, so with the kind of polar areas in the very far south of Southern America and also Arctic Canada, um, Northern Europe and so on. So in total, we're talking about 50 million square kilometres or 5.8 million square miles of ice. And if we actually look at that on satellite images and try and map them, we're talking around about 198,000 individual glaciers, ranging from very small um, cirque or corrie glaciers that you might have studied, up to much larger outlet glaciers, and even ice caps and ice sheets. Most of the world's glacial ice is found in the Arctic and the Antarctic, but glaciers are actually found on nearly every continent, even Africa. So what do we know about what the world's glaciers are doing? We know, and, and I'm sure most of you have read, most of the world's glaciers are in retreat. So how do we know this? Let's try and break this down. There's lots of examples like this on the internet, lots of kind of then and now pictures, if you like. Um, people that have used historical photographs um, taken in the 1920s, um, early 70s, early 80s, and actually comparing them with the present day landscape. And it gives you a good idea of how much glaciers have retreated. But there's also things that we can do that actually look at how glaciers um, have retreated beyond that. Um, this is an example and um, a case study from Exit Glacier in the Kenai Fjords region of Alaska. And um, I think we can actually put a little link to this study in the chat. Um, it actually tells you a little bit about how we've actually um, measured the retreat of this glacier over time. 
So in this particular example, you can see the yellow line there drawn on 1950. Most of the historical photographs that we've got, the aerial photographs, um, really only go back as 1950. But we can extend our records back beyond this because we can actually um, reconstruct what happened using landform evidence. So um, like many glaciers, Exit Glacier has left a succession of terminal moraines as it's retreated. So that's um, glacial material that's been deposited in front of the ice forming a ridge. And as the ice has moved back, it's left that ridge sitting in front of the ice. How can we actually date those? Well, there's various ways of doing that. Um, one of the easiest ones is to use something like we call lichenometry, um, which you might not have come across before. And, and this um, article that I mentioned tells you a little bit about this if you want to go and explore this a little bit further. But we can actually measure the growth rates of the lichens. And if we know what the growth rate of the lichen is, we assume that the lichen has started to grow once that surface has been exposed as the ice has retreated. So we know the exposure date of the landfall. So that's one way you can do it. We can also use rock weathering measurements um, and, and again a little bit different but um, it's another way of working out the exposure date of the landfall. We can actually work out um, the weakness of the rock and how much it's been weathered since the date it was exposed. And then finally something you might be a bit more familiar with, we can use treeing data, dendrochronology. And that um, if we actually look at the trees growing on the moraine, we can actually use those to date um, the earliest trees growing on the moraine, the oldest vegetation, and that gives us an idea of how long that landform has been there. So if we actually look at most of the glaciers in the northern hemisphere, most of those have been in retreat since the Little Ice Age maximum. And you can see that one marked here on the left hand side, 1815, the Little Ice Age maximum. And that was a period of global cooling, um, but particularly strong in the North Atlantic. So affecting North America and Northern Europe, Scandinavia and so on. It lasted around about 500 years. Um, the actual peak or maximum date varies a little bit from region to region because it wasn't all synchronous. It wasn't at its maximum point at the same time in all different places. But in all, they were kind of right. It peaked around about 1750 to 1850, depending on whereabouts you are. So we know that the glaciers have been retreat since then. So why are we so concerned now? And the answer to that is the speed of ice retreat has actually accelerated in recent decades um, as climate change has led to increased temperatures. So let's have a close look at what's been happening in more recent decades. So how do we measure what's happening in a glacier? Um, some of you might have actually looked at this. Um, one common way of looking at it is to look at a glacier as a system um, with inputs and outputs. So we measure the, the state of the glacier by measuring what we call the annual mass balance, the balance between what we call accumulation and ablation. So accumulation covers all the different inputs, not just snow, but also things like rain and hail and freezing rain and snow that comes onto the surface from avalanching and so on. And then at the other side of the, of the balance, you've got ablation. Um, so the key part of that is probably melting. So surface melt um, and water that flows out of, from underneath the ice in meltwater rivers, um, but also processes like iceberg carving, if it's um, a glacier that actually carves into the sea, um, and windblown snow that gets blown off the surface of the glacier. Obviously a little bit smaller in their uh, contribution, but still quite important overall. So each year we actually look at the balance. If over the course of the year the glacier has actually gained more mass than it loses, in other words, um, it's acquired more snow and there hasn't been as much melt. Then it's got what we call a positive balance. Overall, the glacier will start to advance. It will flow forward because it's gained mass. Opposite side of the equation, if the glacier loses more mass than it gained, a negative balance, then the glacier will retreat. And that's what's happening with a lot of the world's glaciers. They're getting um, probably a similar amount of snow and rain and so on in the winter months. But in the summer months, they're losing more mass. More of the snow and ice is being taken away in the summer months than is actually being accumulated in the winter. So over time, most of the world's glaciers are actually in negative balance and are therefore retreating. So if you look online, you'll see lots of graphs like this. 
This particular one um, is produced by the World Glacier Monitoring Service, the WGMS, and I think we can post a link to that in the chat for you. Um, it's a good source of information about the current state of glaciers across the world. And what the WGMS does is it does a regular monitoring program of a set of reference glaciers. So this particular graph shows the annual mass balance of these reference glaciers over the last 30 years. So these reference glaciers is a set of around about 40 glaciers from different parts of the world, chosen because we've actually got very long records going back 30 years or more. So annual records, somebody goes out there and actually measures the change every year. And because they're actually taken from different parts of the world, we can actually use them to cut and to put together a global picture of what's happening to most of the world's glaciers. So if you look at this graph, um, the years with the positive balance are those shown in blue. And you can see there's only very few years where we've actually got a positive balance. The years where we've got a negative balance are those shown in red in the lower part of the chart. So it gives you the idea that obviously since records began going back to about 1950, there's definitely a sustained trend um, showing negative um, balance. And as you can actually see, um, certainly since 1970, um, we've actually got um, quite a sustained trend, um, certainly um, the last few decades um, of increasing negative balance. And in fact, ice loss rates have almost doubled every decade since 1970. And even if you look at the last kind of 10 to 20 years, eight out of the 10 most negative mass balance years have been recorded since 2010. So just in the last decade, um, the negative balance of glaciers has become a significant problem. So I want to have a little look at a case study um, using a couple of glaciers in Alaska, the Muir and Riggs glaciers. Um, in the Glacier Bay National Park. Um, as you can hopefully see on the map, I've, I've shown a little star to show where we're talking about. And I've got a nice example there, a, a then and now pictures, what the glacier looked like in 1941 and what it looked like in 2004. So if I'm gonna just talk you very briefly through just a couple of graphs to show what's actually been happening with those two glaciers. That's the cumulative mass balance and the annual mass balance since 1959 up to 2005 and as you can see um, we've actually got um, a quite sustained um, negative balance we've got a, a little bit of a blip in the middle in the late 70s where it kind of um, went a little bit um, less negative but then again it, it's kind of accelerated since that point so if we actually plot that cumulative mass loss that steeper slope after the late 70s or early 80s, which I've shown by that pink arrow, shows that we've actually got increasing negative balance. But what I want to do now is just to break that one down and have a look at what's happening in different parts of the year. So this graph is actually just takes the mass balance for the winter months in the blue graph at the top, and then the mass balance for the summer month in the blue graph, uh, in the red graph at the bottom. And we've got a trend line on there just to give you an idea of what's happening. So the winter trend line in the upper graph shows that um, the mass balance is decreasing at a rate of minus 0.004 meters water equivalent per year. And the summer trend line um, is, is minus 0.016 meters water equivalent per year. So the mass of the glacier is decreasing in both seasons, but the trend is amplified during the summer month. So most of the melting, most of the ice loss is occurring in the summer because we've got that steeper trend line that tells us this. Why is there more melt in the summer? Well, obviously a lot of that is to do with simply with warmer temperatures. We've got warmer temperatures in the summer month um, to do with global warming, therefore we've got more melt. But if you think about it in the northern hemisphere, we've also got examples where we've got increased hours of daylight. So you think as you got towards the Antarctic, the days are longer in the summer. And also the sun's at a higher angle. So you actually get um, stronger solar radiation coming through at that time of the year. And as you'll have noticed, there was a negative trend on that winter um, trend line as well. So there is some noticeable loss of mass during the winter months. And that's been linked to warmer temperatures during the winter months, not as pronounced as it is during the summer, but it is still having an effect. 
So overall from this we can actually conclude that the warming trend is, is really what is responsible um, for that change in mass balance. And it's been quite noticeable over the last few decades. And we've linked this to increases in greenhouse gas concentrations and obviously um, all global climate change. And I just want to turn my attention. So far, we've been looking at um, terrestrial land based ice. But sea ice is also a major cause of concern, and that's something that you'll have picked up on quite possibly from the news. There's lots of news stories that, that feature about this. Scientists are particularly concerned about the shrinking extent of annual sea ice, particularly in the Arctic. So the graph here on the left shows the 2012 Arctic sea ice minimum, which on the September the 16th of that year um, actually reached the lowest ice extent in the satellite record. And just for comparison, if I just show you um, this year, um, 2021, which is shown by the red line on this graph, um, this year we actually reached the 12th lowest sea ice extent in nearly 43 years of satellite recordings. And it's part of a long term trend towards lower ice cover. More ice is melting in the summer than we've actually got refreezing in the winter. And obviously this makes the news quite regularly. There's lots of um, concerns about things like habitats for polar bears and, and the effects that it's going to have on, on marine biodiversity in the region. And also it's of interest when we come to think about um, access to uh, mineral resources in the region and the possibility of um, opening up shipping perhaps um, along the northern coast of Russia. There's lots of attention on it for those reasons. So I talked a little bit about what's happening with the Gulls glaciers. What I want to do now is talk about why it's important. What are the impacts of glacier loss? Other than losing um, quite a nice aesthetic landscape feature, we all know that glaciers look nice. Does it really matter if we lose all of the world's ice cover? What difference is that actually going to make? Is it going to affect people? Certainly we don't have ice glaciers in the UK, so it's tempting to think that we aren't going to be affected by, by losing glaciers. But what I want to do now is explore just a few of those impacts. And I've actually borrowed this diagram and I'm going to talk about them um, in these different categories. So I'm going to look at some of the global impacts, some of the regional impacts, and then some of the local impacts. And I put together some resources. So certainly at a future date, if somebody wants to get in touch, I've got a few kind of web links that I can pass on to you um, and explore just a few examples or case studies of some of these different impacts. So first of all, let's look at the global impacts. And one of the most frequently cited and perhaps the most significant worldwide impact of melting ice is its contribution to sea level rise. Melting glaciers add to rising sea levels, and that has a variety of impacts. First of all, it increases coastal erosion. If we've actually got rising sea levels and, and sometimes an increased storminess and bigger waves coming in, um, then we get increased coastal erosion. And I use the example here on the left hand side of Haysborough in Norfolk. Um, so a good example from the UK where we've actually got cliffs um, and quite a lot of coastal retreat going on linked to higher sea levels. But it's happening in lots of different parts of the world as well. Higher sea levels can also push more water inland during hurricane related storm surges. So the example there on the top right, um, coastal flooding after Hurricane Laura back in August 2020, um, but also related to storminess in other parts of the world. So certainly we're getting um, increased storm surges with, with rising sea levels in recent years, which are threatening at the coastlines in the UK as well. So not just related to hurricanes. And then obviously we've got lots of concerns about low lying coastal areas. A lot of the world's major coastal towns and cities um, are actually located in low lying areas. So we could be losing large areas of London, New York, um, other major cities around the world. But we're also losing infrastructure, transport routes that, that actually run along the coast, um, agricultural land, and certainly a lot of the world's small island nations are particularly threatened by um, rising sea levels, simply because in a lot of cases there isn't any higher land for people to move to. So I've used the example here on the bottom right of the Maldives. Um, so that one we well, you might be familiar to. And certainly it's expected that Mali, the capital of the Maldives, is expected to be completely submerged by the end of the 21st century. So we've got the, the human side of this. Where are all these people going to go? You know, they're going to be migrants, refugees. They're going to be looking for homes in other countries. 
So there's, there's a big social aspect to some of this sea level rise. So we actually look what's been happening sea level um, over the period 1901 to 2010. Um, global average sea levels have risen um, 0.19 metres. And it's ice loss from the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets that's often cited as the main driver of sea level rise. But recent studies have shown that smaller ice caps and glaciers elsewhere are actually losing more mass than either the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets. It's the smaller glaciers and ice caps that are actually more sensitive to climate change and are therefore um, melting more and losing more mass. And we've got more meltwater coming from them. So annual rates of glacier thinning have nearly doubled in the last 20 years. And the resulting meltwater accounts for 21% of global sea level rise over that same period. There's still quite a bit of uncertainty about the volume of glaciers and ice caps and the rates at which they're retreating. There's a lot of research going into that. But it's estimated that if we actually lost all of the world's ice cover, global sea level would actually rise approximately 70 metres in total. And that would flood every coastal city on the planet. So a few other global effects to have a look at. Uh, the next one is to consider the Earth surface energy budget. Obviously, there's a little bit more kind of physics involved with this, but perhaps the simplest aspect of this to have a look at is to have a look at albedo. What does this mean for solar radiation? So snow and ice cover reflect about 85 to 90 percent of solar radiation back into the atmosphere. If we reduce or even lose the ice cover altogether, then the Earth's surface will simply absorb more of that heat. And if we absorb more of the heat, that has big implications for um, global warming and also has impacts on the ocean atmosphere system, which drives our weather systems. If we've actually got more heat being trapped in the atmosphere and we've also got um, more energy given off and being trapped, then it's going to do things to um, our ocean currents. It's going to affect um, our weather systems. We're going to actually start seeing changes in um, precipitation and storm tracks across the world's oceans. And it's going to have just big impacts on, on weather and climate not just in the kind of North, North Atlantic and Northern Hemisphere around the Arctic, but across the world. And that links into the next part I'm going to look at, which is um, um, ocean circulation. Sorry, I've forgotten I put that one in there. I'll, I'll, I'll just stop and just go back a second. Um, I've used an example here, um, just looking at Greenland. So this is actually comparing um, the solar radiation reflected by Greenland in the summer of 2011 versus the amount that it reflected um, between 2000 to 2006. So you can actually see that um, the blue shading is, is actually showing um, how much is being reflected. So more blue shading means more reflection. And the darker blue shading around the edges of the, of the ice sheet in particular is showing those areas where you've actually got most melting going on and therefore more of the solar heat is actually being reflected back in, um, is being is not being reflected back into the atmosphere. I'm saying that the right way around. So virtually the entire ice sheet is showing some change, but some areas are showing close to 20% less solar radiation than a year ago. So going back to what I said before, linking into the ocean atmosphere system, and um, the final kind of global impact that I was wanted to flag up was potential effects on the world's ocean circulation. So you might be familiar with the idea of, of, of the um, ocean circulation being a, a great ocean conveyor belt. It's, it's the thermohaline circulation. And the key part of that is that normally at the poles, um, warm water um, flows northward and, and then eventually meets the cold water and sinks, drops to the bottom of the ocean, flows back south um, in the North Atlantic as, as, a, as a cold current. And basically um, that actually drives the whole of the world's um, ocean circulation. So melting ice could have a significant impact on that because melting ice adds more fresh water to the Arctic Ocean, which makes the sea water there less dense. Water that's less dense will not be able to sink and flow through the ocean. So that will either disrupt ocean circulation, maybe even stop it altogether in the long term. And that's going to have significant impacts on weather and climate and also on ocean biodiversity. 
simply because in a lot of parts of the world, the warm current actually, um, so the UK, for example, means that we've got milder weather than we would have otherwise. If we switched off the ocean conveyor belt, we would actually start having much colder weather, the kind of weather that you probably see if you looked at a similar latitude in um, Canada. So if you looked at St John's in Newfoundland, that's a similar latitude to London. Look at the weather there compared to what we get here. It's a completely different climate and it's all down to that ocean conveyor belt system. So moving on, let's have a look at some of the regional effects. And these are actually where we see they're actually affecting the people that live in these areas, really affecting society. They're a lot more tangible perhaps than some of the global effects. So glaciers are an important national resor uh, natural resource and across the world, millions of people rely on the meltwater the glaciers provide. Um, an estimated 1.9 billion or 22% of the world's population lives downstream of glaciers and ice packs and actually depends on that meltwater as their main source of drinking water. If you look at China and India and other parts of the Asian continent, some of the world's major rivers are largely fed by snowmelt from the Himalayas. Think about the Ganges and the Brahmaputra, the Yellow River, some of the world's massive big river systems, they're fed by glacial meltwater. In the shorter term, if we actually have um, melting glaciers, that is actually going to increase water volumes and flow. So we might end up with more flooding going on. So think about those large communities living downstream, they're going to be prone to more flooding and more kind of riverbank instabilities. But in the longer term, as those glaciers shrink and retreat and disappear completely, we're actually going to have decreasing flows. And that will have big impacts because that's going to jeopardise agriculture um, and access to drinking water for millions of people. And elsewhere, living, people living in arid climates might rely on glacial meltwater for at least part of the year. So I've used the example here of La Paz in Bolivia, where actually um, the world's one of the world's major cities and most of its drinking water is actually drawn from snow melt um, from the nearby glaciers. Um, they've actually had big problems with drought in the last few years. They built some big dams and reservoir systems, but the water levels are running low already because simply the water supply from the glaciers is starting to dwindle. And of course, lots of regions also use that glacial runoff for energy production. Peru uses um, 21, uh, sorry, 81% of, of its electricity comes from hydropower. 50% of India's hydroelectric power is generated by runoff from Himalayan glaciers. And even in Europe, if you look at Switzerland, Austria and Norway, these all rely heavily on hydropower and these are often fed by glacial water systems. And in the current climate, as we start switching um, to alternative energy sources and renewable energy sources, hydropower is one of the ones that a lot of countries are looking at. But obviously, as glaciers shrink, decreasing water flows is going to limit how effective these projects might be. So turning to a completely different problem, I'm probably hedging a little bit before uh, beyond the edges of the glaciers, but we're thinking about the same environments. Beyond the ice margins, just in front of the glacier, um, glaciers, um, a lot of areas are actually um, permafrost. So in the Arctic, temperatures are starting to thaw that for permafrost. And scientists are concerned that carbon dioxide and methane released from that permafrost is going to cause additional warming by adding to greenhouse gases already in the atmosphere. And if we look at the amount of carbon stored in the permafrost regions of the Northern Hemisphere, it's estimated to be almost twice the amount of carbon currently um, contained in the Earth's atmosphere. So we actually have um, melting permafrost, the amount of methane and carbon dioxide that's being um, released um, from the peat bogs and the glacial lakes um, underneath the permafrost is going to have big implications um, for our greenhouse effect. Today's underground carbon might be tomorrow's carbon dioxide or methane. And obviously we've got economic impacts, perhaps you know, not as important as some of those kind of significant global problems, but for the countries we're looking at, um, they're going to have marked impacts on people's livelihoods and, and, and on, on those countries' economy. So looking at the left hand side here, um, looking at the leisure and recreation industries and tourism. In New Zealand, glacier tourism is a multi-million dollar industry. 
Lots of people go to visit um, Franz Josef Glacier, which I've shown here. And this is an area that's actually been threatened um, by glacier retreat. And um, there's lots of guided walks along the surface of this glacier, and they're actually finding that it's becoming unsafe. Um, as the ice thins, as the surface morphology, the, the relief, the shape of the landforms actually change on the ice surface, you might have more crevasses forming, um, lots of kind of um, melted areas. They no longer can take walks onto there. And obviously that affects on um, other kind of leisure and recreation activities that people use on the ice. And obviously in other parts of the world, you think about these cold mountain areas, the ski industry is also threatened um, by changing um, climate. We've got a reduction in the natural availability of snow, as well as a shorter ski season. So that has big um, economic implications for these societies. So moving on now, just to the last section, some of the local effects. So these are actually related just to particular glaciers. Might not happen all over the world, but in some cases there are significant problems. So one of the local effects might be runoff and hazards. And the particular hazard I've picked on um, is what we actually call glacial outburst floods. So as the earth warms, an increasing number are actually being threatened by these glacial outburst floods. So in some valleys, as the glacier recedes, as it retreats, meltwater accumulates under the ice and forms a glacial lake. Um, sometimes it's a subglacial lake or it might be dammed up by the ice or simply dammed up behind the moraine, the terminal moraine. When these lakes become too full, there's a risk that they might breach or overflow and then release huge volumes of water and, 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 re and result in catastrophic flooding. So the black and white picture I've used here on the left, I'm not sure how clearly you can see this, but we'll, we'll try. Um, this was actually a result of a glacial um, outburst um, flood from Lake Palcacocha in Peru. And back in 1941, this actually buried the town of Juarez, which was downstream, um, in a major mudslide and actually killed thousands of inhabitants. You also get um, other catastrophic flood events, not just from glacial outburst floods, but also from um, just general avalanches and rock falls. So the example on the right, a more recent example, and if I can say this right, the Uttarakhand flood in the Indian Himalayas, which occurred back in February 2021. And if you remember that in the news, that left over 200 people killed or missing, many of them actually workers at the Tap of Van Dam, the hydropower scheme um, that was being fed by that glacial meltwater. And if you actually look worldwide, more than 12,000 deaths have already been attributed to glacial lake outburst floods worldwide. And then the last local effect, not looking at people, but looking a little bit more at nature and the environment, what are the impacts of glacial loss on our biodiversity? Some impacts um, vary from one glacier to the next. This is why they're actually under the local um, impacts. Um, a lot of them relate to water availability, um, changes in vegetation cover, um, suitability of habitats. And of course, in the case of some river and marine um, animals, we're thinking about water temperatures and water quality, the amount of sediment being released into that water which can have significant impacts on the wildlife living there. The prospects for plants and animals relating to glacier retreat are actually a little bit mixed. A lot of us are familiar with the idea of polar bears and the loss of their habitat through sea ice. But if we actually look at land-based glaciers, um, there's also um, a, a reduction in the habitats for a lot of other mammals and, and a lot of kind of plant and animal species. So there at the top left, I've used the example of the endangered snow leopard. While some species will disappear, other species will actually thrive as temperatures change. So it will change the balance in ecosystems, um, not just in the mountains, but also downstream and going out um, into the fjord systems and maybe out off, off the coast in, into the kind of continental shelf areas of, of the world's seas and oceans. So I talked through a lot of impacts. I just touched on, on just some of the main ones there. Let's just have a quick think then. We've looked at what's happened with the world's glaciers. We looked at some of their impacts. What's actually going to happen in the future? Well, to be honest, even if we do significantly curb our emissions in the coming decades, we know that even we are doing that, more than a third of the world's remaining glaciers in the Alps and the Himalayas are still going to melt before the year 21,000. 
When it comes to sea ice, scientists have projected that if our emissions continue to rise unchecked, the Arctic could be ice free in the summer as soon as the year 2040. And recent studies have suggested that it will be difficult to reverse Antarctica's ice loss after the world reaches two degrees of warming. And an even larger increase of 69 degrees Celsius would see 70% of the Antarctic ice sheets disappear. So what can we do? Well, to preserve as much of the ice cover as possible, we need to try and curb, keep or, or curb those greenhouse gas emissions to keep global warming under two degrees Celsius if possible. So that we don't end up with a situation where we're losing a large part of the Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets, which will have major impacts on the world's sea levels and so on. As I said, even if we do meet that target, we still expect our glaciers to shrink. So we are going to be losing glaciers in some parts of the world. So we need to think about how are we going to adapt? How are we going to manage some of those hazards? How are we going to deal with the problems of sea level rise, especially in those small island nations where people have got nowhere to go? How are we going to monitor um, glacial retreat and glacial lakes to manage things like the glacial outburst floods that I mentioned? We could explore strategies um, such as carbon sequestration, um, regrowing some of our forests, for example, or managing peatlands better to try and capture and store some of the atmospheric carbon dioxide. But the main part of what we can actually do as, as geographers is actually more research. We need more research to improve our understanding of how glaciers behave and especially how they behave under a warming climate. And we need to, we need more modelling of, of meltwater. We need more modelling of what happens as the ice shrinks. And we also need more data to feed into our models to be able to predict what's going to happen in the long term, what's going to happen with the Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets, for example. And that's where the work of, say, the British Antarctic Survey comes in. So hopefully I've left you there with a few things to think about, to reflect on what's happening with the world's glaciers, to think about some of the impacts and to think about what's going to happen in the future. So in the next couple of slides, um, I've given um, just a few kind of resources. So like I said, if anybody wants to contact me after this talk, I'm quite happy to supply um, some websites and um, easy to read articles and things that will actually talk a little bit more about some of those case studies. But for the meantime, does anybody have any questions? Um, Amanda, I'd like to say thanks very much for that really informative and interesting session. The pictures on there were so graphic, so interesting. So thank you very much for that. And um, I'm just going to check with Zoe if we've had any questions. So Zoe, have we had any questions? That's great. Thank you very much. I must also say I really enjoyed that session. I love how we get to sit here and learn so much from you guys. And uh, we have actually got we've this the question that's come through has got a few different parts to it and we, you have spoken a little bit about it, but it's quite specific what they've asked. So I just want to ask again so that we can go into it, if we can go into it in any more detail, basically. So it says, um, is there a tipping point for glaciers such that they become so weakened by melting that they collapse? And then it says, how far, so say in miles or kilometres, does the impact of a glacier collapse travel? And it says, I'm thinking of impacts on downstream communities. So we did speak a little bit, bit about these impacts, but I wonder if you know how far these kind of things can can get. Um, there's two good questions. Um, Try to remember the first. The first one about the tipping points. Yes, yeah. there's definitely critical thresholds or tipping points for glaciers. But each glacier or each ice cap is going to have its own critical threshold simply because the way the ice works, it has a lot to do with regional climate yeah. and microclimate, but also to do with the physical geography, what we call the underlying topography. Think about the shape of the valley, mm -hmm. if you like. So you'll find that some ice outlet glaciers, you know, you could actually have two outlet glaciers just a few miles from each other and one retreats faster than the other. Yeah. And a lot of that is simply to do with the physical geography underneath the ice. Um, obviously, on a global situation, yeah, there's going to be, you'll, you'll, you have a scenario where glaciers in one part of the world might be retreating a little bit faster than elsewhere, simply because global warming 
isn't um, a standard synchronous, you know, homogenous kind of process. Yeah. You'll find that global warming, climate change is pronounced, warmer temperatures in, in some areas of the world, perhaps not so much melting in others. We're finding that actually the parts of the world most sensitive to climate change are the high Arctic. So the high latitudes. So think about Arctic Canada and Alaska, um, northern Scandinavia, Siberia. Those are the places that are actually losing most. And obviously we're also losing the sea ice there as well. So it, it, it's a combination of both. But like I said, we, I mentioned with the Antarctic, the idea we know that there probably is a tipping point. If we if it shrinks to a certain, well, you know, to a certain size, beyond that point, then yeah, it's going to be difficult to regrow it and it might just completely disappear altogether. Um, but the second part of that question, if I can remember it now, um, about the impacts yeah. downstream. Yeah, was, do you want me to read it out again for you? No, it just says, you can if you like. It will help yeah, because it, you it says how far, so in miles, kilometres, does the impact of a glacier collapse travel? I'm thinking of the impacts on downstream communities. And like I said, I mean, let's take the Himalayas as an example, because that, that was a good one. I mentioned this idea, obviously the Ganges and the Brahmaputra rivers, some of the world's major rivers feeding um, India and Bangladesh. And we already know that those communities already have problems with flooding. You know, they're, they're prone to other hazards, they're prone to um, cyclones coming in um, from the south as well. So that exacerbates it. And they already have problems with flooding. Um, but obviously those are kind of hundreds, thousands of miles from the Himalayas. So if we actually get um, big floods, we can actually um, drive up the water volume and actually impact on those communities a long way downstream. Some of those other hazards, like the glacial lake outburst floods, you know, you're probably talking um, 10, 20, 50 miles. Mm. So you're probably talking a little bit less. Impacts on biodiversity, um, you look at Scandinavia, um, just changes in, in the meltwater, more meltwater going into the fjords and into the sea systems, um, you know, that's hundreds of miles downstream and it could be changing water temperatures, changing the environment and therefore affecting the species are actually able to live in those ecosystems. So it's going to be changing the composition of ecosystems. And obviously it's also bringing more sediment as it melts, um, you get more sediment being released into the river, so it makes the water cloudy, so it affects the water quality. So again, you know, some of these some of these impacts can actually travel a long way. That's, that's what I was getting at. You know, I said there are no glaciers in the UK. It's tempting to think, does it matter? Yeah, some of these impacts, you know, they're not just local or regional. They're actually kind of traveling a long way. And if mm -hmm. we think about changes in sea level, they're global impacts. They're going to affect everybody. Yeah. It's quite scary, isn't it? Actually listening to it like that. <laughs> um, for well, thank you very much for that, and thank you for your answers there. They were great answers. Um, we haven't actually got any more questions at the moment as it is, um, but what I have done is put some links in the chat, and also I'll pop your departmental Twitter on there, and also our Twitter. So if there's any future questions that anyone wants to pop through, they can pop them to us either on social media or via email if they want to. So thank you very much for that. Thanks, Max. Oh, sorry, Max, you're just still on mute there. Apologies. So I'd just like to end the session by saying we hope you've enjoyed the session today and found it useful and we look forward to your attendance at our next event. If there's anything else we can help you with, please take a look at our outreach page on the UOC website where you will find all our resources and information about our next events. So thanks very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye for now.